Welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, this is Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director. I am actually in the Eastside Freedom Library um, and wish that you were all here with me. Um, but in this moment that we're living through, which is now six months long, um, we're not able to all be together tonight. Um, but we can connect our minds and our spirits through the internet. Um, we're thrilled to have my old friend, Mark Nowak, uh, and his new book, Social Poetics, uh, props to Coffee House Press uh, for publishing the book. Um, we have two old comrades of Mark's and mine, uh, Jason Evans and Holly Krieg, who are also going to join us in the conversation, particularly as we talk about the effort to organize bookstore workers, and particularly to organize bookstore workers and writers together in the early part of the 21st century. Um, our plan tonight is uh, I'm gonna speak a bit with Mark, Ben, Holly, and, and Jason are gonna get involved. Um, we wanna encourage all of you watching, uh, if you have comments and questions, to use the comment function on the Facebook page, type those in. My colleague, Clarence White, will be tracking those comments and questions, and he'll be sharing them with the panelists when we move to that phase of the conversation. So let me say just a little bit um, about who our guests are. Um, Mark Nowak grew up in a working class family in Buffalo, New York. His mother was a clerical worker, and his father became vice president of his union at Westinghouse, at the Westinghouse assembly plant, which closed in 1985. Mark worked at Wendy's when he was in his 20s, earned an MFA, and taught at the College of St. Catharines. There he participated in efforts to organize independent bookstores uh, here in the Twin Cities with an impact on bookstores and bookstore workers elsewhere as well. Um, Mark is a very important poet who's published three books of poetry in a genre really of his own invention that he calls documentary uh, poetry. We highly recommend Mark's poetry books. Um, Mark also had an amazing project in 2006 and seven with workers at the Ford plant United Auto Worker Local 879 members who were facing the closing of the plant and Mark conducted a poetry writing workshop with them, videotaped some of them reading their poetry, went to South Africa and shared those videos with South, South African Ford workers who wrote poems back uh, to the workers in St. Paul. Uh, this is a story that Mark tells in brief in Social Poetics um, but really deserves to be told at even greater length when we get the opportunity. Um, um, I want to introduce our other two guests, Jason Evans, uh, who works within the Minnesota State Colleges and University System as a math tutor and instructor and as a member of AFSCME. Holly Krieg is an abolitionist organizer, artist, and mom to an eight-year-old named Sophie Lucy Parsons. Uh, Holly is also the director of organizing with Moms United Against Violence and Incarceration and a co-founder of numerous organizations, um, most recently the Chicago Community Bond Fund. So <clears throat> we're going to start um, with Mark. And uh, because Mark is a, an artist of words um, and he chooses words very carefully, um, and in social poetics, uh, does a great job of unpacking words and their histories. And so I thought a great way to enter into his uh, universe is to start with asking him, why is the book called Social Poetics? What, what does social poetics mean? First of all, thank you, Peter. Uh, it's... Um you know, both such a great joy to be here with all of you uh, and a little bit of a sorrow that we can't be doing it at the Eastside Freedom Library, uh, such an incredible space. And um, 
you know, I, one of the things uh, with the title that you asked about, about social poetics is that, you know, it's really uh, my attempt to, to bring the creative writing workshop into uh, the kind of community that I grew up in. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to take a moment before I answer the question a little further is um, today's kind of a special day because uh, my dad uh, was born on this day in 1937. Uh, and I have, since we're not like, I'm not there with you, I can do a little show and tell. So I have just two little things I want to show. Um, the first one uh, is this photo of him in September 1955. And this was uh, the photo that was taken the first day he started working at the Westinghouse factory in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he was 18 years old, had just graduated from high school and worked there uh, until they closed the plant uh, and he was forced to take a early retirement. And so I keep these objects next to my desk to kind of uh, inspire me while I work. Uh, the other item is this brick, which is a brick from the actual Westinghouse factory. After they tore it down, uh, they gave this brick to all the employees as a memento to their service. Uh, but to me, it always reminds me of these, uh, you know, moments during the 1980s and the 1990s when factories all around the country uh, were being shuttered. Uh, communities were just being wiped out, be they in Buffalo to Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, elsewhere. Um, and so part of the work of social poetics is to reach into that history and find a way in which this thing that I do now, the Creative Writing Workshop, and that I've done for a very long time in public spaces, uh, Poets in the Schools program, Poets in the Prisons programs, uh, to bring that to um, trade unions and worker centers both around the United States uh, and in places around the world. You had mentioned the, the Ford workshops and part of that project was actually taking the poetry workshops to Ford plants in South Africa. Uh, so it's called social because uh, it's not an isolated poetics. It's a poetics of social gathering, uh, often outside of traditional institu institutions uh, of culture and the arts, of union uh, workshops, uh, workshops with worker centers and others. It's also my abbreviation for socialist poetics. Um, my dream was that, you know, uh, we wouldn't quite have the kind of national politics that we have right now coming up. Uh, we might have a, a choice that included things like uh, national health care, uh, the erasure of college debt, etc. And so it's my attempt to try to think through poetry and creative writing within that kind of atmosphere for the future. Thank you. So um, I want to jump in and say to people who are watching that we had a tech problem at the beginning. Um, and so you may have missed my introduction to the Eastside Freedom Library. That's okay. It's more important that we hear from Mark and Holly and Jason. Um, so um, we're, we, I think many of you are kind of being dropped into this part way in. Um, I also can't resist that I did not know, Mark, that you were going to show a brick uh, to us. And I wanna match your brick and go one more. So we have two bricks here at the Eastside Freedom Library. One was part of the Italian Hall in Calumet, Michigan, where there was a tragedy of Christmas in 1913 uh, during a strike of uh, largely immigrant iron, uh, copper miners. Um, and 46 children uh, were suffocated and stampeded to death um, in that Italian hall. The community allowed the building to collapse. In 1981, a theater company from Ann Arbor, Michigan, visited Calumet with a play that they had written about the copper miners strike. And the community gave every member of the company a brick uh, from the Italian hall. David Bernstein, who I'm sad to say David passed away May 1st uh, of COVID, uh, in New York, uh, but David gave us that brick before he and his partner Paula Rabinowitz moved to New York. The second brick uh, comes from 6th Street North in the Warehouse District of Minneapolis. 
the site of Bloody Friday, the showdown in ni July 1934 between Teamster strikers and Minneapolis police. Um, the police have been playing nefarious roles for a good long time in American history. Um, and the repression of the labor movement is something we also need to remember. Um, and when that street was paved over, some friends hustled over there and scavenged the bricks. And so we have a brick from the site of the 1934 strike as well. So these physical mementos are a very important part for us, especially of telling middle school and high school kids who come in here doing research projects that history is tangible. It's, it's not only in books. So thank you and, and, and happy birthday to your dad, Mark. You. Um, it's special to us that we're sharing this day with you. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, also about uh, the way you worked with the word workshop. Um, and, and I was so moved in reading your book that you cited Edward Thompson, who was a very special teacher of mine and a great force in the field of labor history. Um, and, and in talking about how the concept of workshop has evolved over time and sets a stage for the kind of work that you're doing now. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was very influenced in the writing of the book um, by that kind of tradition of E.P. Thompson, Howard Zinn, Stuart Hall, Raymond Williams, uh, I think, in particular. And so I think it's really important to look back at the, at the etymology of language and the etymology of words. And so with that term workshop, you know, it's, we now think of it as, uh, at least in creative writing, you know, you, a space where you get together at a university and people sit around a table and and critique their poems but the word really has a as i document in the book a, a really kind of long working class history like a workshop was a place where workers uh labor power was appropriated by the boss right it was a place where workers began to organize against that and struggle against that so the the word workshop itself has a has a uh, a really long history of, of being part of that um, appropriation of labor and of, of worker agency and worker struggle. And to me, it felt really important uh, to put that into a book about creative writing and about creative writing workshops, because it's something that I, you know, have, have never heard brought up in a, in a scenario like that before. And in fact, a lot of the workshops uh, happen often, right, in, in spaces that had been factories, right, and had been gentrified in communities into art centers, etc., with very little notice, unlike the Eastside Freedom Library, with, with very little notice of that working class history that's part of the organization. So it's really important to, to kind of trace that history and that language. It's something I learned from Raymond Williams and, and kind of continue to practice. Thank you. Um, and there was one other word that I wanted to ask you to, to play with for us, and, and that's your use of the word conjunction. And when I read that part of your book, I thought about the work that we're doing here at the Eastside Freedom Library, where we borrow the language of the Kambahi River Collective and, and talk about intersectionality. And so we, we wanna be an intersectional space between different communities, an intersectional space between different kinds of activities, art, labor, so on. Um, and you've settled on this word conjunction as a way of, of, of talking about, I think, this, these kinds of intersectionalities. Yeah, and so um, I'm glad you brought up the Kambahi River Collective because uh, with the Worker Writer School, which we'll maybe talk about a little bit later, um, you know, I was finally able to bring the members of the Worker Writer School, domestic workers, taxi drivers, street vendors, and others uh, on a writing retreat uh, up here where I live on the edge of the Berkshires. 
And uh, because she lives up here and was interested in the Worker Writer School, Barbara Smith, one of the co-authors of the Kambahi River Collective, came and visited us for a day, uh, talked about the writing that statement uh, with the workers. And, uh, she also edited a press called Kitchen Table Women of Color Press and brought examples of that and said how important it was for working people to write and publish and perform their work. It was a real kind of inspiration for us. Um, I, I, again, in that tradition I was working out of, like it, Stuart Hall has this idea of the articulation. And I felt within the US context uh, that no one really kind of knew parts of the definition that he was talking about. And conjunction seemed like a, uh, a word that I could use a synonym as part mm -hmm. of it. And it just started ringing out to me because I remember as a kid that, uh, that um, little tele children's television conjunction junction, what's that function? Uh, and kind of did a, a, you know, a close reading that luckily my editor edited out. I think it was eight pages by the time I got done with it. It's only like two pages in the book now, but like what's really happening like that Mm -hmm. came out in this era when the factories were closing, right? And beginning to close in the, in the 1970s. And it really is, if you, anybody rewatches it now, it's like such a lonely thing. It's like one train worker, like jumping from train to train and there's no setting, there's no people around, there's no passengers, there's no other workers. And it felt a little haunting to me in a way when I, when I watched it. Mm and read it. But I think it was also inspired by all of you on this video right here, all right, and this chat. Uh, certainly my work with, uh, with Peter, with meeting the challenge, and with the um, labor history film series at the library, and with Holly and Jason, with the Borders Union organizing drive, and, you know, our focus on, like, artwork and graphics. And, like, it's so amazing today to see like good websites and good t-shirts for like left and progressive organizations. Because when we first started doing this and talking about these things, it, everything was so, like there was no sense of that thinking about aesthetics and thinking about culture meant something to working class struggle, right? And so when we were all doing this in the, you know, us in the late 1990s and, and the border stuff in the early 2000s, like we really pushed that, right? The poster design, there's an example of one of them in the book, which I know Holly has handy uh, right next to it. But this, this sense, yeah. of, thank you. But this sense of like, it, it should be struggle and it should, over, it should be resistance, it should overcome conditions, but it can be beautiful too. Like that's, that's not, something that we should take out of the equation. And in fact, I think today, you know, in terms of young people who I'm so inspired by in, in struggles around the country and around the world, they get that now, right? That, that is evident in a lot of the stuff that they're producing for social media and elsewhere. And so it's really nice to see that transition happen because we felt, uh, I think like, and Holly maybe, and uh, Jason can both speak to this, but I, I think we felt out on like an aesthetic island that we could be workers and artists and union organizers and activists all at the same time. So I don't know if Holly and then Jason, you want to talk about that? Great. And maybe introduce yourselves because I think it did uh, get cut off. Maybe the intro got cut off on Facebook a little. So just a little short. Uh, who you are uh, would be great. Sure. Jason, you want to start? Okay. I'm Jason. I'm, I'm a mathematician and I tutor and teach math. And that's pretty much all I do all day is math. Do you want me to? Well, Holly, well, Holly why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, first? Holly, please. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Holly Craig. Um, I am the Director of Organizing for Moms United Against Violence and Incarceration, um, co-founder of some other abolitionist groups, and um, mom of Sophie Lucy Parsons. Um, and Jason and I and our comrades organized our bookstore successfully in 2000. And... Is that when we got a contract? But we'll get more into that. Yeah, I'm um, only here. So... <laughs> so you know, one of the conjunctions that Mark writes about in Social Poetics is the coming together of writers and bookstore workers um, here in St. Paul in particular, 
um, in the early 2000s. And Jason and Holly were both a very important part of that. And because we're hosting this event in St. Paul tonight, though, hopefully people are watching us all over the place. Um, we wanted to honor the work that Jason and Holly had done and bring them into the conversation. So Jason, can you tell us a bit about the organizing campaign at Borders and beyond? Sure. Um, a lot of what I remember is, uh, I think maybe shortly after uh, spring 2001 or 2002, maybe, Holly and I talked about how much retail sucked and <laughs> um, changing that and how to change that. And one way that seemed uh, productive and one thing that we knew about were, were unions. So we decided to talk to a couple different unions. I'm not gonna say who, but the one that was responsive to us was the UFCW. Uh, at the time there was 789 out of West St. Paul. <clears throat> Bernie Hess and um, other names I don't remember. Christensen. What's that? Jennifer Christensen. Yes. Jennifer Christensen is now president of the local. Yeah. Bill, but I don't remember Bill's name. So. Bill Pearson. There you go. Yeah, yeah so they were really course. receptive to retail organizing. Um, they mainly, I think, represented meat packers and um, grocery workers. So we were sort of the oddballs of that group, but they were really cool to us and listened and they had some sort of, uh, some progressive ideas on a, you know, campaign and yeah, I was just energizing. I think meeting them is, is what made it a little bit easier than I thought it was gonna be, to be honest. Um, you want me to continue? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we, I, I think I could say we had a short campaign. It seemed it seemed pretty short. People seemed into it. Um, you know, we talked to our coworkers. We had events. Um, we organized, uh, signed cards, filed a petition, got an election, won the election, and, and uh, then the hard work began. Uh, I I don't remember how long the contract negotiations took. But in my mind, it seems like two years. It might maybe less, but in that time, I think is when we did the bulk of our interesting work with Mark and uh, with Don WA, with with uh, other people in Twin Cities like Kieran Knudsen and Jeff Pelizinski, and you know the IWW was sort of born from that. Uh, we did one day in July events. We did all kinds of stuff during that time. So while the negotiations were terrible, the what, I think what it was born out of it was great. Holly, you want to jump in? Yeah, that was an extremely abbreviated history, but I know we don't have a bunch of time. 725. Um, well, it was, there, there were lots of challenges that um, Jason maybe doesn't remember. Um, there were, you know, a lot of folks who were very interested in the idea of organizing and, and organizing the context of being many of us, you know, identifying ourselves as artists and writers, um, in addition to being retail workers. Um, but there, there was some pushback from some folks for sure, but particularly management who did a number of things to try to fire me before we unionized. And I'm sure they retaliated against Jason too, I don't remember. Um, sometimes they would change my schedule the, like the morning of my shift so that I would be late. Anyway, those are things that happen in organizing a uh, union, uh, but we, we did come together and it, you know, in addition to organizing um, as a union, as a collective bargaining unit in a traditional sense, you know, we, we were working along with Mark and others from UFCW to organize as a community, not only as a community within the uptown neighborhood where our store was, which was populated mostly by other retail workers, um, but also with Walmart workers, um, where there was a new Walmart. Um, I think if you remember, Jason, we showed up on the day um, that that Walmart opened and we paraded through and handed out information about UFCW. Yes. Um, um, so that was, I mean, that was exciting because because I, I always then understood organizing as happening within the context of a community and with 
artists as, as um, crucial as a crucial part of that. Um, what Jason mentioned um, one day in July, which was a commemoration of the 1934 Teamster Rebellion, in which police shot hump and killed how many workers? I can't remember now. Two. Yeah. More, many more were shot, but two were killed. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's come back to police and labor in a minute. Uh, but you know that that was very much about artists. Um, I did an installation that was in which I you know put worker uh, work shirts and concrete to represent those workers who were shot. There were people who did all kinds of amazing work. We had musicians. It was very much about embracing the idea that that the, that this was about organizing within within community and and. You know that that art and aesthetics are an important part of that, and, and, and writing and storytelling are an important part of that. It's so crucial for us to then to make these kinds of connections, you know, to our own histories, right? Like I, I had the thought previously about the fact that my grandfather was an I, Union iron worker who actually died on the shop floor two weeks before he was supposed to retire. My grandmother was um, a, a sewer a sewing worker with and with the Amalgamated Ladies Garment Workers Union which eventually became Unite Here. Um, so many other connections that we continue to make. And I, I, I just wanna say that I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful to Mark for helping us, I think, see the importance of sort of building those narratives and our understanding our, our place in this context and, and understanding that there is so much more to build from, from that and from what are what we were doing at the time, and I, I like to think that I've continued to do that, and I know Jason has as well. Um, so that's and yes, we got a contract, but that wasn't the important part, honestly. Negotiations are BS. It is a power power dynamic that um, isn't like we have. There's mediators, right? There are all these things that are supposed to happen in order to make this like a conversation in which you're supposed to make concessions, and they give concessions, but really the power is in organizing the workplace, in organizing as a collective. And all the things that we would do, that like Jason mentioned, besides what we did at the negotiating table, um, all the actions we had, um, all the ways that we engaged a community of supporters, like a broad base of, of supporters, um, allies, comrades. Um, I think that was really the crucial part. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a lesson that I've learned in organizing in other spaces too, right? That even though there may be the presentation of a negotiating table, that's often not, that's often a facade, right? And so we have to see where, what our true power is, that it comes from working in community together, um, rather than being in a position to have to make concessions uh, before we're at a negotiating table that isn't real, right? That it's, it's a performance. <laughs> That's my daughter, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Question. Well, I'm gonna just jump in with uh, one other thing is that in that, pro in that kind of waiting game uh, for um, Jason and Holly and their coworkers to um, go through that negotiation, um, we all, um, we used to meet all the time, kind of regularly, uh, and we had this idea that uh, what if we could throw a uh, kind of an assembly or a conference for bookstore workers from around the country, right? Because we didn't want it to be simply, um, you know, uh, what was happening, as Holly said, in one store, but we wanted to kind of expand it out. Uh, and so uh, Karen Knudsen, who you mentioned earlier, who is now running for president of the CWA uh, in the Twin Cities and has a great kind of campaign going. So everybody listening, support him. Um, he got us uh, use of the Communication Workers uh, Union Hall on Lake Street. And we uh, all put out word to other organizers uh, and bookstore workers that we knew uh, we were supposed to have the Borders uh, Anchor Store in Ann Arbor uh, come, but they had been kind of a, on strike at that time and were, uh, couldn't make it down. But we had uh, one of the original Philadelphia organizers come, workers from the uh, Woodland Pattern Book Center in Milwaukee came. Uh, our friend and pal, Emmanuel Ortiz, uh, who was working at the unionized uh, Cafe of the Americas bookstore, Resource Center of the Americas bookstore. Uh, he was there, a num number of other people came in. Uh, we put the event together on the day of the World Social Forum, uh, which was a 
a great kind of larger global organizing uh, platform at that time. And it, it felt like really, um, it, was an, it was a really uh, important day for me because we could see, and Peter, you were there uh, part of the day as well, I remember. And it was just, uh, it felt like a, a model for how to make something larger than ourselves. Uh, and I know that I had, um, just before COVID-19 hit in New York City, been in talks with workers who had been organizing bookstores in uh, New York, um, McNally Jackson Bookstore, uh, the Housing Works Bookstore, and others. And there, that same desire felt present again to like not only make this a workplace struggle, but make this a much larger struggle. Uh, and so I just want to thank Holly and Jason for, for you know, providing such an incredible foundation for doing that uh, 20 years ago. So Holly, tell us some about what you're doing now. Happily, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, just just in quick response to Mark though, I, I that event is blazoned in my memory too. It was wonderful and it makes me think of what Miriam Kaba, the wonderful, I hope you hopefully all know her work, uh, says about how you have to prefigure the world you want to live in, right? And I feel like that's what we were trying to do and, and that we were doing. But anyway, my shirt, you may have noticed, it says, um, Stop Killing Black Women and Girls. Um, it's from an organization that Moms United works with um, called Survived and Punished. Um, and it's a number of organizations uh, that kind of work in this sort of collective, um, kind of, I like to think of it as trans-local organizing because it's not about creating one like large centralized agency. Um, that works on, at the intersection of, of gender violence and um, criminalization. So I do work that is both about sort of participatory defense, whereby we work within community um, to kind of uh, mitigate against the harm of this carceral system, specifically in cases where uh, women and girls and non-binary people are charged with acts related to survival and self-defense. Um, and normally those are situations when which someone is charged with first degree murder um, or some other um, uh, criminalized act that's considered violent. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're always working to make these connections. And I think something that Mark speaks to in social poetics and in all the work that he does is really that we do this work in relationship and we heal in relationship action. Mary Kaba says that too. Mary Kaba should be here too. Um, so the so so we do that. Um, we work specifically to try to get people um, outcomes that whereby they don't go to prison. People who are in prison, we try to get them out. Um, but we do that in the context of a larger demand for prison and police abolition. And in the last few years, I started to think a lot more about the connections between the work that I was doing earlier on, some of the most important organizing work in my life, which was organizing my workplace with my beloved comrades and coworkers, um, in which we were risking everything because we were living check to check and constantly at the threat of being fired for doing what we were doing and being told, if you don't like it here, go somewhere else. What else is there? Everywhere we see is like low wage retail jobs, low wage jobs, right? There is nowhere else. Um, so I've been thinking about how, you know, the event, right? The one day in July in which, um, you know, we were commemorating this 1934 Teamster rebellion and what was so crucial to, what was so, a, an important part of that history, of course, is, is the people, police, but also other people being deputized to, to come and, and quell this rebellion, this insurrection. Um, and so I think it's it's important, especially in the context of organizing happening, Black-led movement organizing happening all around us. Um, recently, people organizing in response to um, the police officers um, responsible for killing Breonna Taylor, uh, not being charged. Um, you know, that to, to make these connections between labor history and police violence and, and, and the proliferation of prison and all, all forms of incarceration, because police have always been the natural enemy of organized labor. 
And I think we can say that this goes back to some of the first versions of police, right? Which were people who, well, in, in one case protected private property, but in another case were primarily responsible for capturing um, pe enslaved people who had had run away or or quashing insurrection and rebellion, um, which I would include running away as a form of rebellion, of course. Um, and so, uh, it's 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 so I think like looking if if you look at um, um, the history of insurrection amongst enslaved people enslaved workers um, as being part of this uninterrupted history of, of police violence against workers and I don't mean to oversimplify that but I think that is one way through which we can make a connection um, that that has continued to be the case right and and where labor has shifted and it's been necessary to create this, uh, not just a permanent underclass of workers that includes criminalized workers, sex workers, undocumented workers, but also workers with felony convictions, right? Who have limited negotiating power because of, because of, because of their positioning uh, within, within society, because of this criminalization apparatus. Um, it's really important that labor unions connect with workers who are criminalized workers, uh, again, undocumented workers, sex workers, people doing other kinds of, of informal labor, um, unpaid labor like caregiving, that's most of my labor um, in the last few years, and, uh, and prisoners. Because whether or not prisoners are actually performing the labor that they historically did, like in the industries, right? Years ago, prisoner, in, in, in prison workers were making furniture and um, doing all kinds of work that also people in trade unions were doing. And that's an interesting history too. But, uh, you know, the, the most of the labor that in prison people perform now is the maintenance of the prison, right? But that is still a form of labor that's exploited labor. And I think we have to, we have to identify ourselves as a community of workers across bars. And I think in the same way that the insurrection of, of in, in enslaved people uh, as workers um, forced the political decision of emancipation, right? That troublemaking forced that decision, um, as opposed to the way we learned, you know, Abraham Lincoln was our salvation, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, that, that, that maybe that will be the case in our working together across bars to abolish police, prisons, and capitalism. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the vision to which I'm committed alongside just the wonderful people I learned from every day. So like I learned so much from Mark Nowak, but also Miriam Kaba, Dr. Andrea Ritchie, Dr. Beth Ritchie, Monica Cosby. I just want to go on and on and on um, about the, all the people, particularly women of color who have led the way. And um, you mentioned before um, the, the Kami Collective and how, I mean, those, those were some of the first words spoken making these connections, right? Um, and so it's, it's funny how we keep making these connections. It's so important that we make them explicit and communicate them. And, you know, and I would say Mark's book is a wonderful testimony to how those ideas were produced and how they're connected. Um, and I think if, if I were to meet someone young today who asked, where, where could I start to, to build the ideas for emancipation, social poetics would be right at the top of the, the list that I would offer. So I, I want to say to people that are watching this that um, we invite your comments and questions. Uh, if you use the comment function on the Facebook page um, and send us comments and questions, the panelists will uh, try to respond. So we, we want to, in this wacky world that we're living in at the moment. We want to try to be as interactive um, as, as we can. Um, back to you, Mark. Well, uh, Jason, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, um, that moment of trying to organize the book workers from around the country and, and why it felt important to take it beyond you know, that store in Uptown uh, and into the larger world. 
well, survival, right? One store, I don't know the exact number, but I think Borders had 500 plus stores across the country, across the world. They could have shut us down any minute, fired all of us. They could have done a number, any number of things. Uh, so yeah, I mean, reaching out to other workers, not just at Borders, but specifically at Borders, it was more of a survival tactic, I think. Uh, better position ourselves. Um, you know, this wasn't sort of an idea out of the blue either. This, there was workers that had organized borders in New York City, uh, I think Massachusetts, and we learned from them. They literally sent us every scrap of paper they had. And, and this was uh, electronic stuff, but, you know, still a, quite a lot through negotiations, through tactics they used. Uh, memos everything so just that connection kind of prepared us for what we were going to face during negotiation so you know yes yeah, survival <laughs> i think that was the only way we we're going to succeed we can i mean it's isolated it's purposeful you you have one shop the shop's a store isolate these workers you can't talk to anybody you can't really reach out and we did some pretty stupid things that we should have been fired for we we stole everybody's email and and sent them like propaganda, <laughs> you know, we, we did things that rightfully we should have been fired, but uh, we, I think we were creative. I definitely think that. And what, it could be a little bit um, about some of those techniques that were used, you know, there was the uh, outreach to try to get people to either buy or not shop at the store, uh, handing out flyers outside the store, uh, I remember us doing it on uh, the day after Thanksgiving, the largest shopping day one time. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what the techniques uh, were that were used? Yeah, I think it was you and I, right? The two sort of Twin Cities orphans, nowhere to go. <laughs> um, well, yeah, we, we did, a, we did a, a sort of typical boycott where we asked people not to shop over a couple of days. I think it might have been a whole weekend, which, yeah, that was successful. The, the sales were down by X percent. I'm not sure what. But then we thought, well, let's do the opposite. And we had people actually come to buy books in support of us, which actually our boss loved that. But sales in that instance went up quite quite a lot. I think it, it in total, they kind of evened out. But I think that showed that we had the community support. Um, yeah. People are, people are always willing not to do something, but it's it's a whole different thing to like come to a place and actively like participate. So, and we yeah. had little flyers, right? So that when people came in during the buy-in day, they were communicating to management that they were there making a purchase that day in support of um, the and in response to our organizing effort. Yeah, I think that was as much for us as it was for borders. I mean, you know, they don't really care. But I think for us as workers, people coming and supporting us, like, gave us a lot of energy and, you know, hope. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty, uh, yeah. I think one of the things that it's important to remember about that time, too, is that, you know, there had been this kind of buildup of action and resistance in worker communities, right? It had started around the time of, of NAFTA and all of us young people were inspired by those Zapatistas at that point in time. And it built up to uh, Seattle, right? And the battle in Seattle. Um, and then 9-11 happened and there was this incredible retrenchment and stepping backwards from that. And that was the moment that we started. And yeah. so it felt, you know, it was like, you couldn't say anything against the, the powers that be against the way society was organized against, you know, all kinds of different unions and workers. And, you know, it was, it was a great kind of pullback from, you know, doing anything progressive in the country at that moment. And that is when this happened, right? And so that is a, um, it's, it's maybe something to keep in mind in the present moment that we're in right, that we ha have gone through things like this in the past. We have gotten in spaces where there's been a pullback of, of, uh, 
a lot of our uh, rights, you know, that was when the USA Patriot Act was passed and all kinds of things like that. Um, so I say that not as kind of warning, but as hope for the, for the work that we still have to do ahead of us, uh, that, you know, this, this stuff we've been talking about came out and happened at a moment like that in history. There's been a impressive flurry of organizing going on here in the Twin Cities in the last month of uh, spy house coffee shop workers, of uh, Surly Brewery, uh, uh, brew pub workers. Um, it's, it's exciting that and some of it is it's inspired by the danger that COVID uh, has brought to these workers and, and with employers who are not providing workers with the kind of protections that, that they need. Um, I'm gonna back up and Clarence, my colleague Clarence is going to share a question with us, right? Clarence? Yes, uh, the first question uh, from Johanna Gilmore, who also had a few other shout outs, is asking, do you remember how many stores were unionized? In our case, we were the only one at one point. Uh, I think Ann Arbor started to organize around the same time, maybe a little bit after. Um, but as far as border stores, I think we were the only one in the world at that minute. Um, there were other organized stores. Powell's, I think, was organized at the time uh, in the indie store in Portland. Um, yeah, that's, I think we were the only corporate bookstore. We were including the, the worker organizing of the, the theater that was down the street from us. Hmm. So it's sort of include that in the organizing that we were doing. Clarence, got there, is a, there is another question here. Um, for any of the panelists, uh, did you receive any support from writers or people in other parts of the book world, such as publishing houses or distributors or anything like that during your union drive? Did you find any resistance from other workers in the book world? Um, I don't know if Holly remembers, but like Howard Zinn had sent something to us I don't know what if it was a note or a donation for one day in July, but um, of course, Mark and <laughs> Mark was a writer that definitely supported us and helped us, literally helped us like on the street helped us. So uh, yeah, we had a lot of press. Um, we had a lot of attention for a minute and I don't remember anything bad coming in. Um, some local musicians, um, but, but then in the context of the event that we had, which included was it was called Resist Retail Nihilism, right? That first convening. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, there were lots of um, writers, and I think some folks from some smaller publishing, independent publishing houses were there too. Yeah, I you know I am um, in the book. I talk a little bit about that. How I kind of first met uh, Jason and Holly was that I had been the uh, chair of the political issues committee for the National Writers Union Twin Cities Local. And uh, the UA, we were formed under the UAW. A lot of people don't know that the Writers Union was formed under the UAW. So we, um, I had gotten some people together who were on the committee and we started meeting at the old uh, Ford Union Hall on Ford Parkway across the street. Uh, and so we kind of had a connection with Ford and that's actually how we started doing those poetry workshops, Peter, that you mentioned uh, at the Ford plant. Um, but when uh, Jason and Holly announced the organizing drive, uh, I wrote um, a motion to be passed by the National Writers Union in support of the workers. Uh, and I think that's how I first got in touch uh, with the two of them. Uh, and it, I have to say, it kind of felt so feeble in a way, like, okay, we signed this thing and we support, well, if we're writers, I mean, well, of course we should support bookstore workers. And I think one of the things that always was a bit surprising to me was that when we would announce these things, we, the Twin Cities is such a great literary community, right? Great presses, great institutions, et cetera. But 
we didn't really get a lot of writers out to support, like to step away from their desks and to step into action. Um, and I had always wished there had been more of that because if we are writing, we need to be supporting everybody who's part of the process of the production of that book, the distribution of that book, the sales of the book, right? So we should be supporting the Teamsters because UPS drivers are delivering our books. We should be supporting now the US postal workers, right? And because that's how our books are traveling to readers right now. We should support workers like at McNally Jackson and Haymarket, who I mentioned, who are trying to organize their those bookstores. We should support the SEIU cleaners who clean the offices at the publishing houses. Like the, the list is kind of almost endless, right? The sanitation workers who pick up the recycling from our offices, like it's one big struggle. It's, it's not an individual thing. And that's hopefully one of the things I try to get across in the book is that as writers, I feel like we have a, an ethical uh, responsibility and role to be part of this larger struggle, not just through the things we write, but, but how we are writers in the world. If, if I can, Mark, let me ask you to come at it from the other side as well and say a little bit about the work that you've been doing back to this concept of workshop, uh, the, the worker writers schools. Um, what does it mean to taxi drivers, auto workers, domestic workers, the, the many different cohorts of people that you've worked with to find their voice through writing. And, and then maybe even a little bit more, your advocacy in the book for collective approaches to writing. So sure. what, 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 what are you experiencing What sort of the other side of, of these relationships? Yeah, well, you know, I like, I, I've been thinking a lot about the story of the person who works at a, uh, is a cashier at a grocery store during COVID-19, right? And kind of is behind a shield, uh, is forced to go to work, maybe as part of a union, maybe as not, depending on which state they're working in, right? And works an eight hour shift, like scanning all of our groceries, right? Like risking her or his life, not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to. And so I think about someone who then like, every day has ideas, right? Like thinks, you know, goes home and texts one of their friends or complains to their partner about how terrible it was, the person who refused to wear a mask, right? Why is that person buying eight quarts of chocolate chip ice cream? Like whatever the thoughts are, right? And maybe there's even a few uh, people who write those ideas down, right? Jot in a text message, that's a kind of writing. In storytelling, that's a, that's a kind of uh, a, a creative cultural practice. And let's say they wanna like go a step further and like maybe write and try to get this thing published or write it and perform it at an open mic. Where does that person go to be able to develop that craft, that connection? Where does that person go to then see, oh, there's someone who is an elder care worker who's experiencing similar things at work, who is a taxi driver and is experiencing similar situations at this moment in time as essential workers. There, we, we have done uh, a really kind of terrible job at building institutions for that kind of thing to happen. It's one of the beautiful models of the East Side Freedom Library, right? That there's a space we can go. There's where we can go week after week with the Worker Writer School in New York City. We meet every first Saturday of the month. When COVID hit, we met the first Saturday of March. Then I started talking to the workers. We had been studying the haiku. Uh, the poetic form and how it was used in like Japanese American internment camps and in the prison writing workshops at Attica and Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez's use of haiku. Amiri had this form he called Loku, C-O-U-P. Uh, and so when the pandemic started, I was like, wow, you know, the book, my first book in 11 years is out in March. Uh, I canceled the entire, all the events for it. The worker writer school, I don't know what's going to happen because we can't meet the first Saturday of the month anymore. And we met how we're meeting now, the first Saturday in April, right? Domestic worker, taxi driver, street vendor, all got on Zoom. 
and we talked about haiku, what we were writing, coronavirus haiku, we call them, right? And how essential frontline workers, if you're in an MTA booth, what is that like during coronavirus's peak in New York City? We have haiku by one of our, our workers, uh, members uh, from Lesotho who works in the booth, the MTA booth, her haiku. Um, we, and so there's, what I found is that there was more of a desire to do this, right? Because we were social distancing, the workshop became a place of social connection. And so we started meeting twice a month, all through the spring, all through the summer. Uh, we took a one month break and now we're gonna start up again in September. It'll be our 10th year of the Worker Writers School. And everybody's like super excited. We haven't seen each other for six or eight weeks now. And we're going to start again. We're going to start our practice of getting around a table. Like this is our kind of digital table now. Having our conversations. Starting to talk about our work. And then as I always say at the meetings of the Worker Writer School. I should have called this thing the Worker Talker School. Because <laughs> all of you are great at talking. But it's the Worker Writer School. So let's take what we've been saying. And take out a pen and paper and start to put that down, right? There's a great Minnesota writer, uh, Maridel Lesur, uh, who had a pamphlet out uh, called Worker Writers. Uh, and she says, uh, it's kind of a pamphlet to teach workers how to write. Uh, and she said, nobody else is living your working life. Nobody else has your story. You need to write it, you need to put it down. And so that's what we're trying to do at the Worker Writers School. Oh, that's great. Clarence, do we have any other questions? Um, no more questions. Um, I just, uh, I appreciate uh, the talk about solidarity and in, in the writer and book community. I know that when I was a bookseller too, uh, we get a lot of deliveries. Um, the delivery people who were represented by unions, UPS, the US Postal Service people, they provided the best service. They were always the best to us. The others like FedEx and DHL um, were really difficult to deal with. And um, people like libraries and people like booksellers. So um, we appreciated that, that solidarity. Um, it doesn't appear that uh, anyone else has asked a question. Um, uh, Johanna Gilmore uh, mentioned that she worked at the borders from 97 to 99 um, and that there's and is in publishing now and that there's almost no uh, unionization in the industry so um, you know there's still work to do definitely so I just want to say to those of you that are out there watching that um, this has been recorded, and so it will uh, live zombie-like uh, on the Eastside Freedom Library's Facebook page. It will get posted to our YouTube uh, page. Um, encourage your friends uh, to watch it. Um, I want to thank Holly and Jason for taking time out of their busy lives to, to be with us tonight. It's really great to, to see you both. Um, and, uh, and Mark, it's, it's wonderful to, to see you. And um, as you might imagine, I have stacks and stacks of books that I want to read. Knowing that I was going to have this conversation with Mark got me to read Social Poetics, put it at the top of the list. And as I said, I, I could not be more inspired by a book that I've read in the last decade or, or more. It's a great introduction um, to, to the ideas and the practices of, of imagining, prefiguring another life and how to get there. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jason and Holly. I wanna thank my colleagues, Clarence White and Carla Reilly. Um, We'll cuss out whatever gremlins there were at Facebook that messed with the first part of this. Um, but it's great that the rest of it has come through. Um, thank you all. Thank, and I want to thank Coffee House Press, um, not only for publishing this book, but 
um, you know, for giving Kalkali a Yang a start and publishing so many important writers from this and other communities. Yes. So thank you all. Any, Holly, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I don't have a poker face. I'm sure that was obvious. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted to just make a suggestion about a project that maybe all of us here could embark on together and maybe some of the folks who have joined us to watch who are interested in these topics. Um, I don't write books, but I occasionally write haiku inspired by Mark. And I write a lot of teach-ins for the organizing work I do. And I was thinking that it would be wonderful if we could get together uh, remotely for now and write some kind of teach-in that makes some of these connections between uh, history, police history, prison history. There's so much amazing writing that's happening um, within prisons. Um, and I know that there are a lot of um, incarcerated writers who would love to be part of writing collectives too. Um, and I just, I'm thinking about how we can continue to sort of make this connection and maybe create a tool that could help inspire more community building and maybe some more organizing. And I think that would be amazing. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Clarence, you there? Clarence? Did we lose Clarence? Well, it Clarence? Like, uh, I'm here. Okay. Yes. You want to say something about the blog, Clarence? That product placement going on here by Jason. Yes. Mark. <laughs> uh, and pack stuff. So it's like I found Mark's uh, other books. <laughs> so we have several sections to the blog. One of the sections is what we call our book geek shelf talker. I don't know if that is what you're referring to. That's one of the things that we would love people to contribute to. And if you go to our website, click on the media and then the blog, you'll see instructions on how to submit something or you can just send something to us. Uh, also, we are looking for people to contribute their own stories and experiences, especially now in the time of COVID, but also uh, during this time of uprising and, and social change, uh, folks are more than welcome to contribute blog entries related to that as well. Um, and since we are a place of letters and we are a community of letters here in the Twin Cities, uh, it seems only appropriate that we, we add more words to the conversation. Right, so that's the East Side Freedom Library's website. Great, Jason. Um, I was wondering, do you take book donations at East Side Freedom Library? Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. Well, I was, you know, I just unpacked books, so I got, I got a lot of books for you. Uh huh. Well, you got my email. All right. Great, great. We were just, just at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, Jan Mandel, who had been uh, Marion McClinton's partner for much of his life. Marion passed away this, this last year. Jan has given us Marion's complete personal library. Um, so one of the most important African-American directors and playwrights. Um, I feel like, you know, Mark mentioned Maridel Lesueur we have a medicine wheel that Meridel made with a chapbook that she typed herself back before the days of computers mounted in the middle of this medicine wheel that like those bricks that I talked about, there are many ways that the spirit of people who have done the kind of work that we've been hearing about tonight, that their spirit is here. Some of it embodied in the books that they've given us uh, some of it embodied in a brick or a medicine wheel uh, or other material objects. So, Jason, I look forward to taking in what you have to offer. And Holly, I, I do hope you'll look at the blog. And part of what's happened in this moment of the pandemic is we're, we're finding that the website itself can become a vehicle through which people connect with each other by sharing their stories with each other in a blog form. Um, so we hope that people will not only read other people's stories, but feel inspired to, to tell their own. So we are birds of a feather, all of us, fortunately. So thank you again for giving of your time tonight. Thank you everyone who's watching. 
um, we look forward to much more. Stay well, everybody. Thank you.